time for two more questions because we want to keep it going. I saw you first and then you in the back. Please then. <laughs> Three. Okay. As I should point in here, but it's okay. You, it's all right. First thing. Okay. Possession is 90% of the law. <laughs> Um, I find this all very depressing, um, and my, my question is probably rhetorical, but if you have an answer, I'd love to hear it. Um, so, you know, Bob talked about how all these people that are, you know, Obama is appointing, you know, come from only a certain perspective, and Damon talked about how we, you know, gave out all this money without making sure that any of it is going to help real people, and Harvey talked about how Main Street never gets listened to. And so my, you know, my question is, what is the answer? I mean, how do we make sure that Main Street voice and the consumer voice, you know, is listened to and it's part of this, this process? I mean, beyond those of us in this room who talk to ourselves, you know, all day long. Um, I mean, I know that there's some solutions proposed, like, you know, Financial Product Safety Commission, which, you know, is important and could do some good, but that's down the line, and even if it happens, uh, you know, regulation will be happening in other places and formed in the White House. Um, our organization and other consumer groups that proposed an office of consumer affairs in the White House, the consumers are, um, haven't heard any, you know, sign yet that Obama's considering that, although you think it's consistent with his desire to hear competing views. So, you know, how do we institutionalize it? How do we make sure that Main Street and consumers are heard in the walls? Oh. That's a broad enough, that's, hang on one second. That's a broad enough question so that I'm, it, it suggests a procedure, which is I'm going to have all three people ask their questions and then give all three of the panelists a chance to make brief closing statements, addressing them as you will. Harvey, and I, will, I would just say we're going to have to get extraordinarily aggressive with the people who we probably think right now are our friends, but they may not be on our side. Go ahead. The last two questions, and then we'll start with Harvey for last comments. My name is Lee Diamond. I'd like to ask Mr. Kuttner and Mr. Silvers about private equity firms, because obviously they capital has transited there in an enormously large amount. So even if, you know, we don't have the arrangement now to do in terms of public, it still seems, to, I mean, they have the capacity to create markets themselves. So, and that can have enormous impact. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Okay. And last but not least in the back, identify yourself. Um, two big problems that I see in this crisis, you know, there are many, but short-termism and um, what people are being incentivized to do. So one, can we, can we have an opportunity right now to regulate long-termism in some way, and what does that look like? And then two, what are the three most important things we can do in terms of executive compensation? Like what are the most effective, powerful things that we should be looking for? All right, so we have three closing comments, starting with Harvey. I'm only going to respond to that last question. I think there are um, panels later today that will address a lot of the questions that you've just asked, and I'm looking forward to hearing those answers as well. All right. Uh, boy. <laughs> um, first, uh, I, I think that um, uh, private equity, which is a term that was invented to, to help leverage buyout firms escape the opprobrium that it was associated with the term leverage buyout uh, it, uh, is um, one manifestation of, the, le of the, lever the credit terms and deregulation that Bob was talking about. Um, uh, they would be worthy of an hour into themselves. Um, I think they have to be looked at as one, one more pool of kind of silent capital that has systemic implications. Uh, Sec uh, secondly, Tracy, uh, three things on comp. Um, I think that your question almost answers itself, that the real issue here, and it's present in the credit agencies and it's present in the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, um, is the, um, and it's, you know, it's not entirely the executive's fault. Um, it is kind of, you know, the we have met the enemy and he is us kind of thing, um, is that creating uh, comp structures that are short-term and focused entirely on stock price, and particularly on stock price in an asymmetrical fashion, uh, which is what options do uh, and what the combination of stock-based comp with large severance packages do, uh, which is the, 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 uh, the, I, the, uh, the company wins, I win, the company loses, I win. Uh, kind of arrangement, um, uh, that the only bad outcome for an executive incentive that way is kind of modest positive performance. 
right? A real disaster and you get a hundred million dollar check and, and a goodbye. Uh, and of course things do really well, you do, very, you do you know, even better, right? Those structures are, are crazy. Uh, and by the way, there, I think many people in the business community know, know that they're crazy too. Um, the, um, um, we need a reform that makes executive pay uh, long-term long and symmetrical uh, and, and, and set in as complex a manner uh, as the actual nature of running a large business enterprise it, it is complex. Um, the, and how do we do that? Um, I would suggest that we do that um, uh, in, a co in basically two ways. Uh, one, because I, because I think mechanisms, uh, I think to Bob's point about credit reform, uh, credit rating agency reform, uh, uh, mathematical mechanisms are terrible at fixing things like this. They just get end run. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're the Maginot line of public policy. Uh, and um, the, uh, the right way to think about this is some combination of having really strong and independent boards answerable to long-term investors, not short-term ones, uh, and secondly, tax policy, and thirdly, tax policy, and fourthly, tax policy, and, and you get the point. Um, the, <coughs> um, uh, the, the, the last thing is the question about, you know, what do you do? Don't, uh, don't you know, you guys sound really discouraging. Um, here, and this is really, I guess, the, the answer to Simon's question, and I wasn't agile enough to think of it and respond when Simon answered it. The reason why I have a lot of hope uh, is because um, for the last eight years, and perhaps for longer than that, uh, outside of certain somewhat isolated voices in Congress, and outside of that brief moment in which uh, Senator Sarbanes led uh, after Enron, there's just really been no one to shout at, right? There's been no one to talk to who will listen, who has any hope of listening. Uh, um, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons I have a certain, one of the reasons I uh, said the things I did about Hank Paulson, by the way, is that he's an exception. Uh, he's actually, uh, many people may not know this, but you can actually talk to him. Uh, there was no one else in the Bush administration in economic policy uh, um, uh, uh, outside, uh, uh, certainly around the White House and the political appointees and the agencies there were some people uh, who was like that. But we are going to have, we, meaning the public, the average, the average American and their representatives are going to have people who are going to listen. And it's our uh, responsibility to talk to them. Uh, I'm using that as a kind of metaphor. I mean, I'm using that as a... Uh, I don't mean simply picking up the phone and calling people. There's a thousand different ways in which you essentially get politicians who have <laughs> some openness to you to pay attention. Uh, and and that, that is the opportunity that sits before us, and it's very great. Okay. Um, Bob, you get the last word here. Well, 